what's up, Shannon? How you feeling, brother? What's up, Jory? How are you, man? Nice to meet you. Uh, you too, man. You too. You got in a bit early, brother. <laughs> Look, go ahead oh. and make me a moderator on this bad boy. <laughs> oh, you want? Oh, okay. How do so I? So you that? would just you would just uh, click on my face. I got you. Done. And boom, boom, boom. Do I need to drop off being a moderator, Jory? Oh no, no, no. Everything okay. is great. Yeah, okay, everything cool. is great, man. Um, I just beat you into your own room. Yep. You know the funny thing is. I think that same thing happened last week with, uh, have you, you probably know them as CL services. They're now pro sponsive. Okay. I saw that post. I don't know those guys as well. I saw your post. I didn't get a chance to listen, but I did see them. I saw CL services. and I was like, I don't really not familiar with that name. So, right. Okay. Well, they're, uh, you know, I'm out of the Atlanta area, so they are a, a pretty established organization that serviced the, uh, Southeast. Um, but now, they're growing, man. They got probably seven or eight offices. Uh, I think the most recent one was opened out in uh, Colorado. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's just a freight organization. Uh, they broker? Are they a broker? Or trans? Yeah. Trans? What do they do? They are a brokerage, and you know they come from the tree of C. H. Robinson. Um, uh-huh. You know. Uh, I think the guys worked with Alan Lund when they were at C.H. Robinson and uh, Silver. So, um, yeah. So it's just a just another organization that stemmed off of that tree. Nice. That makes sense. Yeah, There's sure. a lot of C.H. people out there, man. You know it. You definitely <laughs> That's a massive know. one. I mean, Kevin Nolan, all of them, man. All of those folks are C.H. trees. It's like Bill Belichick of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of, of logistic sport, if you will. <laughs> yeah well that's great um well look uh we, we are in here just a little early but uh i'm i'm happy to get started are you happy to get started yeah man let's get a roll We're good. all right so look uh everybody thank you so much for joining us on the transportation and logistics clubhouse we have our brother our friend to the stage shannon shannon hey man look where are you from <laughs> Grew up in Oregon, but lived in Phoenix for the last 30-something years. So I am from Phoenix, Arizona now, Jory. Oh, man. I definitely hear you. Um, and I was going to ask, what? so was it school that brought you there, or did you move there, you know, during childhood? No, child, I was 10. We moved from Oregon. Uh, my parents are school teachers. Kind of, they met in California. Couldn't move back to California because of the cost. And so... Uh, had some family out here in Phoenix, so we moved out here in like the early '90s, and have been ever been here ever since. Okay, cool, man. Uh, I have, I have. I'm not gonna say similar stories just because uh, uh, my parents weren't teachers, <laughs> but yeah, I I did move from the Northeast uh, and started migrating south, and eventually I landed in Atlanta, and that's definitely home for me now. You know, and Atlanta has you know a certain type of heat. It's a, uh, you know, it's warm, but what's that Phoenix heat like? Is it, is it unbearable or is it, what is it? Uh, I mean, it depends on the job. If you think we got people following <laughs> logistics, I always tell people like, Hey, it'd be probably a different thing if I was uh, swinging hammers or digging trenches right outside. Um, most of those folks, they start real early in the morning. As far as the summer, I mean, when you come to Phoenix, you've got four months of it being incredibly hot, but the trade off is you get some of the best weather in the country for eight months. It's super dry. If you love golf and you love outdoors, you can, you can, you can, you can do all that year round, which is a it's a huge plus compared to maybe some locations in the East Coast. And I think the other selling point out here is you've got two and a half hours. You're in the mountains up in northern Arizona. Five hours you're out in San Diego on the beach. So it's well positioned at a at a at a great price point. So, yes, sir. Uh, my wife and I, you know, we heard about uh, the. The vortices out there. I'm thinking about hitting those up. Uh, have you had uh, the chance to experience those? I have not. I don't even know what you're talking about. You'd have to educate me, Joy. This is going to be right, good. Well, look, let's do that on the phone call after this. One because <laughs> okay. I, I'd be making stuff up right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, Shannon, thank you again for joining us on stage. And uh, you are the founder of Freight Vana, correct? Yes, yes, sir. Co-founder. Right. My, my buddy and I, good buddy of mine, John Camaro, we, we founded the company last year. So he, that is a true statement. Try to switch phones. Could, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So how does one 
actually, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Okay. okay. How did you get into transportation, into freight services? Yeah, it's a wild story. So I, my background uh, is finance from school. Um, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I did some of that in my early 20s, failed miserably. Uh, 2008 happened uh, You're right. from a real estate perspective and that, and yeah, that uh, the real estate investment career, that kind of fell apart quickly as well as a couple other things. So it's a huge learning lesson. Um, I went back and used my uh, finance degree working for uh, some private equity companies for a few years. Uh, and then a good friend um, was working at that time for um, night transportation and had started there out of college. And we got into some conversations and he's like, hey, you really should think about transportation. So in the summer of 2012, uh, I interviewed with the CEO and a few other folks and didn't really know what I was getting into, Joy. Right. But uh, uh Really loved it. Uh, I love the pace of it. I love the the chaos. Uh, someone that gets bored relatively easily, and so obviously in this space, this industry, uh, there's not a lot of boredom because it's different every day. So I really just gravitated to it early in 2012, and now I look up and uh, next, you know, a month from now will be my full decade uh, in in the industry. So. Oh, that is that's amazing to hear, brother. And uh, apparently, so you had the entrepreneurial bug, the spirit in you before, you know, early on. Is that how you kind of like came into the industry uh, in a sales role, like a, actually director of sales? No, I actually started uh, on the account management side. So I oh, haven't shared that oh. story a lot. But yeah, I started in account management. So at, at night at the time, we had the brokerage. A lot of people that are probably listening, if you've ever worked at an asset-based company that also has a brokerage, uh, that is a phenomenon itself, right? And so my first foray in transportation, I worked for the brokerage division, but my number one goal was to kind of figure out how to build the bridge between those two departments within Knight Swift. They were, they were running pretty separately. Uh, undoubtedly, the brokerage was kind of the redheaded stepchild, pretty small, not probably well-respected, definitely not interconnected. To your point, or your you know your statement about connected with sales, connected with mm -hmm. systems, and so I really kind of had this uh, role of okay, how are we going to connect these business units? How are we going to you know leverage our collective talents on both the tech and the sales side, um, and account management side? And so that was my really first four way was like, hey, how do I build this thing? How do we we bring people together um, within a company? And I think anybody you know listening and has ever been part of that it, it sounds like oh there's no doubt like these two companies they just work together and uh, i think more times than not with all my friends in the industry and what i saw personally is you know a lot of things are set up and they actually don't work well together unless you're very intentional and you put a lot of effort into it so my job was really to build that bridge okay hello oh, that allowed you to see a, a a lot of the intricacies of the the industry i would imagine Oh, you learned a ton. And for me, it was here because I was learning through a fire hose on the terms. Like everybody, I was learning systems. Um, unfortunately, at that time, we also had some pretty poor technology back in 2012. And so you realize how underserviced we were there. Uh, but yeah, it was a it was a trial by fire, which most people go through in their early innings in transportation. But mm -hmm. I look back and some of those pains and the system pains and uh, EDI pains and all of it really helped me figure out really quickly like okay well how do we do this quicker faster better um and kind of put me on the trajectory that, that i find myself today so right you must have had a, a real knack for it man because you know going from that role to eventually senior vice president of logistics for night swift transportation you know that that has to say that you were naturally uh you know just adept at putting these pieces together uh would how would what would you attribute that to, if anything? You know? uh, I think I think my upbringing being competitive and loving sports, Jory. So, like, I, I've shared this on, on something years ago, but, like, I always kind of from a – like, my sport growing up was basketball, right? Okay. And I always loved being a point guard. And the cool part about being a point guard is you're kind of that tempo setter. You're the one getting people involved. Um, you're sometimes setting strategy. But at the end of the day, it's not really about how many points you score, right? You're a distributor. And so I kind of took that kind of point guard mentality that I always had from a competitive sports perspective, and I just applied it to transportation, meaning, hey, this is not about me. It's not like, who do I bring together? How do we do this? Like, And so who do we put in the right position? And so I kind of used that as my 
my background being that, hey, I really didn't know anything about transportation, but what I did know about was competing. What I did know is about uniting people. What I did know is about leading without having it be necessarily about me, right? And I feel like that's why I was able to accelerate my career so fast. Oh, that's awesome. A great facilitator, able to see, you know, the strengths of other people and put them in the right spot to, you know, win, to score. That's that's awesome, man. Yeah. I think there's something else about it, too. I'd love to unpack it with the group here, like, and with you, is, like, I also go back to, like, basketball. I mean, I didn't play. I didn't play for my varsity team. I didn't play in college. But where I played a ton of basketball, Jory, was pickup basketball. And so the, oh, yeah. the, the final piece of it that I love, I think pickup basketball is so pure in that if you've ever played or anybody listening's ever played, right, there's no rules um, in regards to like who does what. There's no titles. No one gives a crap who gets paid and who works where, right? All it comes down to when you play pickup basketball, especially competitively, is who do you surround yourself with? How do you win? Because if you don't win, you know what you get to do? You get to go sit. Right? <laughs> and so and so naturally, you find yourself putting yourself in, in a position where people want to play with you because you give them the best chance to win. And so I think like the proving ground of pickup basketball and doing things the right way and wanting people to work with you for the common good of the team so that you can win in advance. Like I just carried that same type of grit and mentality into my corporate career and it served me well. Yes, sir. OK. And uh, I, I, too. Am very fond of pickup basketball. Um, you know, I played only one year in high school. Uh, I had a great time doing it, but it was purely for fun. You know, I was not. Right. I was not that guy <laughs> coming and dunking on everybody. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I had I had a, I had a blast. The competition. Uh, you know, so I, I'm exactly there with you. Um, and it, you're right. There aren't any just automatic roles and you know uh responsibilities you kind of like have to get in where you fit in is is very is very nuanced you have to start you have to feel it you know so yeah yeah so i i definitely hear where you're coming from man and the fact that you were able to apply that same thing in your profession your professional career that's a you know, I, I love the fact that there's some crossover there. So there, there is, right? And I feel like everybody's got those pieces. And I've just tied it back to that because that was a true passion of mine. And, and the mentality of it not being about me or leading just for the sake of leading, for the sake of winning, not leading, which I find like happens a lot in corporate America from my, from my time, my, my now 20 plus years of, of working for businesses is too often, Jerry, I think people want to lead. Naturally, there's a title thing naturally there's like an ego thing sometimes there's a salary thing that comes with that too but the saddest part about all that is that's not really why people want to follow people because they don't really care about any of those things about you right and so like the natural dynamics of leaders and people that follow leaders has zero to do with salary and title and ego it's all about hey are you putting your team in the best position to win and if you're the best person to do that, more and more people will want to follow you. And I think that's the real key of the whole the whole narrative. Man, uh, you know, when I go and edit this, I'm going to put, you know, those bombs, you know, because you just dropped. That's a gem right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people that I think I don't want that to go uh, unheard by people. Uh, that right there is some some very, very good information. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And. You know, you're in the now you're now you're in the driver's seat. Frank mm -hmm. Bonner is operating. Uh, you guys are clicking on all cylinders. You got started 11 months ago. Is that true? Is that the case? Uh, about 10, 10 months ago now. Yeah. 10 months ago, man. So look, how does one start an organization 10 months ago and already has? Are, are you know already have as many employees as you as you have you know like you guys are on the you're picking up everybody you know what I mean how's that I mean that's that's awesome is what I'm basically trying to say yeah I think hey my mentality I think this is a benefit of experience right so I I don't sell the ten years or tell the ten year story without saying that obviously in anything you do you're capturing experience you're learning and then you're also figuring out really talented people that share similar. Um, maybe missions and visions that you do. And so unlike many people out there that are either bootstrapping their logistics business, 
um, scrapping of the dollars to, to try to get the minimal systems to get going, uh, leveraging one partner, you know, shipper or carrier maybe relationship that can kind of get them kicked off. Like we just have this great experience because I've got a team of jewelry uh, in all fairness. Like when we started, we, we were not bootstrapping. We, we, we built the business in a way we could, we could expand quickly. I've got a team of some of the best professionals on both the customer side, the carrier side, the tech side, right? So we surrounded ourselves with these pros that right in day one, I mean, you think about our build and no one would really know this, but I'll share it with you. Uh, you know, we had hundreds of years of experience day one. And when you think about that, that, that becomes the platform. By the way, we also had people that shared and identified with the mission and the vision. So the reality was to scale from that base was a lot easier than if you're bootstrapping, you start with one, you got to add one person, you got to do this. And so um, that was the advantage I had of, of, of getting a chance to, to, to meet and, and learn and, and work with a bunch of people in my career. Also the advantage, obviously, working with one of the largest shippers in the country or transportation companies in the country, because you get a lot of, you got a lot of uh, uh, visibility and learnings for systems and how businesses run at scale both good and bad. And you can kind of architect this path to take the best of what you've seen, remove some of the things that you didn't love, surround yourself with good people, and then just just dream at like a big audacious level and be like, hey, there's there's really no rules. So let, let's figure out how, what we want to be, how we want to show up for our shippers and carriers, and we want to grow like crazy. So that's what we've done so far, but it's still early. And uh, obviously the story still yet to be fully told, but we're, we're really excited about the path. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So look, when it comes down to it, having that experience, being able to work with, you know, one of the, the biggest players to ever do it and learn under that tree, um, you know, you do pick up some game, you do pick up some insights, and you also are able to see some of the, you know, kind of like the, the bad habits, the things that kind of are swept on the rug or people just don't have time to, to get to. Like, uh, were there any anything that you built into your operating procedures to ensure it didn't happen? Things that, you know, might've been acceptable at another organization. Yeah. I think I, number one thing I'd highlight is aligned incentives, meaning um, one thing that happens and, and, and this will probably uh, resonate with anybody that's worked for a larger company. I feel like at, at some point, right, Joy, you try to get everybody quote unquote on the same page and what feels like most of the time is everybody's kind of on a different page right so to get everybody quote unquote rowing in the same direction literally takes so much effort at a larger organization right because everybody's got this initiative and that and there are egos involved and there's titles involved and divisions involved and so my passion in freightvana was wait if we have this talent we have this path we have this mission how do I create a business where everybody's rowing in the same direction and, and that mutual alignment, not saying it, not the words, right? Because those are great. But if I tell people, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's how we all win. But then I do differently. There's also that confliction. I feel like people that set up businesses want to be something, but exact how they set up their incentives, how they set up their teams, how they set up the competitiveness between their teams, like it all detracts from their ultimate goal. So they say one thing. But then at the end of the day, when you peel back the onion, it's a different thing. And I wanted to be very mindful and intentional with John on creating a business where our team work together, um, respect another, um, be able to disagree with one another. But at the end of the day, we are all rowing in the same direction, which is really special. And you're able to do that when you start from scratch. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, that's that, that's that's great information. And I guess even me, uh, I'm, I own a dispatch company, so I own Atlanta Dispatch LLC. And I'm in a spot where I just hired my first uh, two employees. And Congrats. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited. And I have high hopes, big aspirations for these folks. You know, I wanted people who are smarter than me. And, you know, they definitely are in their own right doing, you know, whatever they were doing before. Uh, but you know, the whole point is I haven't really addressed that mission statement, uh, as a group just yet. And, you know, it made me think about the fact that I read, you know, Stephen Covey's, uh, seven highly effective, uh, the seven habits of highly effective people and just how, uh, uh, welcoming other people into that mission building process, how that can 
really have way more buy-in, you know what I mean? So you are rowing in the same direction. So um, I'm happy you said that because now that, that does give me something to really think about um, because I don't want these guys to just think that it's, it's all about me where I need them more than they need me probably. <laughs> you know what I right. mean? Right. And, and you bring up a good point on the mission statement, right? What an opportunity for, you know, a team as you start to bring it together to create it rather than everybody just here's what you think the company is, right? Um, the other thing is values, corporate value. I see a lot of companies do that. Like this is our corporate value, right? But then you ask the people and they don't really believe or buy into that, right? It's It's like this top down. So here, as an example, on that same thread, right, Jory, we, we waited, like we weren't day one, we, hey, this is our corporate value, like, here's what we want to be, right, but when we actually went to formalize our corporate values, like, we had a team of 30 that worked for weeks to come up with what we wanted our values to be, not John and Shannon's values or perceived values of what we wanted it to be, and I think that's important, this uh, distinction, um, and one of those areas where you and in, in your early stages or, or people that listen, like, you know, that's a very critical moment because what are you telling your people if everything's already done and you're the one top down telling them how exactly it's going to be all the time, as opposed to a collaborative opportunity where they have a voice, they have an opinion and it matters. Right, right, right. Agree, man. Agree. So look, I think I, I just, I'm, I'm thankful that you're able to go back and forth in this candid discussion because, you know, a lot of people are growing the companies and, you know, to hear the things that you are, um considering when you took your company from day one and 10 months later you have over 50 employees you know that that right there in itself says that you are doing something right and people want to work with your organization um but like you guys came in at a very very odd time very peculiar <laughs> for you know what the industry typically had been you know at your time at you know night swift um I call this age, I've, I heard it coined and I just run with it, the golden age of trucking where the rates <laughs> were through the roof, man. Rates were, you know, outrageous and uh, it, it forced a lot of or it made a lot of people uh, want to get into the industry. And, uh, you know, folks started buying up these trucks to get these great rates. And how did that fare for you as a brand new organization going out to get customers? Um, asking for more money than they had ever paid before. Yeah, I think that's a good. Like, I think hey, when you when you analyze like a lot of businesses in American history, a lot of new businesses and um, let's call it disruptive businesses actually start because of those times that are a little uncertain, right? Um, and so for us. You know, we use that uncertainty as an opportunity to, to, you know, a lot of shippers, to your point. So how do you do it? Well, a lot of shippers were getting, getting beat up for a couple of years, right? Um, the other thing I think the, and you run the dispatch company, so you know this, a lot of people think that like, oh, these truckers are crushing it. Now, hey, truckers are doing well. The public trucking companies are making good profits. But for anybody that's ever worked with owner operators, three truck fleets, five truck fleets, yeah, you get to see the rates, right? The rates are there. But you also like realize that, hey, they're still working with brokers that are taking their uh, their piece of the pie, right? They're also dealing with um, increasing equipment and fuel costs. They also have all these kind of uh, headwinds coming their way as well, right, Jory? So even though the rates are there, like, let's be honest, the small to medium sized trucker it, it still has some challenges. And the other thing, especially for those of us that have done this for me only a decade, but a decade at that. Like you also are very aware of the market cycles, right? I think I've dealt with three of them in my career. So as far as high up or down or uh, loose or weak or whatever market we're in, like I've seen three full cycles in my career. So I know like the build and the construction is not about starting a business to maximize one piece of the cycle. Like you have to build a business that can be successful in multiple market cycles. And that's what we're doing here. Yes, sir. Okay. So currently, would you say that you are able to lock in some high contracts? But, uh, well, let me, let me, let me not ask you that question in that capacity. I'm just going to tell you my experience of being on, you know, DAT or whatever other load board and, you know, looking at that, that, that lane that was going to get my driver back to their home in a very timely fashion. And I'm okay. seeing, 
you know, I'm, I'm seeing less than $2 a mile a lot of time. You know, what's going on today? Like, why is the spot mark market so low? And, uh, you know, do you feel like being as how you have that experience with the three cycles uh, under your belt, uh, do you think that it's going to bounce back quicker than, uh, you know, people are projecting? Yeah, well, here's, here's what's, here's, here's, I guess here's my take on it would be, yes, the market has declined quickly in the spot market, but you got to also realize that when you look at the five-year historical average versus where the spot markets are at, they're, they're, they were so incredibly high to start, right? Maybe 35% above five-year historical averages, right? Or 30% or high 20s, depending on what stats you want to look at, right? So when we talk about it falling, it's falling towards, it's regressing towards the five-year mean. And there was really only one way for it to go because it's been so abnormally high that from a market cyclicality perspective, it was naturally going to kind of regress a little bit. Now, I think the real interesting part to your question, uh, where it's going, I think people are calling like, hey, it's the bottom and I get the market analytics. But I think there's an interesting few weeks ahead of us here. I think when you look at the seasonal trends, typically the spot market increases. Um, as you get into produce season, right? That has happened for a lot of different markets for, for a long time, right? And so by everybody calling the bottom or the regression, I think this interesting time that we're looking at, Joy, is the end of April and the first two weeks of May, I think will tell us all a lot about that market dynamic you're asking about. Meaning, hey, does it take the seasonal trend line and continue to freshen? Does it stay flat and hence not take the typical seasonal line, but still be 20% above historical averages, or let's call it, you know, if we're only going to make three scenarios, the third scenario, Jory, which is where it declines, keeps heading south towards the five-year average and takes a completely abnormal uh, trend line to what we see seasonally. And so we are very interested, as well as our partners, both on the trucking and shipper side about where that goes. And so uh, I, I don't like to call the bottom. I'm not in the news business. Um, right. I'm in the logistics problem solving business and the partnership business. And so we're really looking in the next month. I think it'd be a very intriguing time to see which way this market's taking. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I guess we're excited too. Um, the, the majority of my carriers, they just want higher prices, man. They want they want higher rates so that they can deal with the fuel, the fuel that's going on. And, uh, you know, what would you know? So you have a sales background. And now you have your own organization where you can set the trend on, you know, how much you're paying. I just want to ask you this question, which is, you know, very impromptu. Um, you know, what, what are some strategies for motor carriers to get, you know, maybe a little bit more out of their, um, you know, out of their experience negotiating with a broker to get a higher rate? Yeah, I think I think it's a, like a look way out, the same way I could look at life, same way I could look way at this business trade. It's a, it's a give and get, right? If you want to treat your broker like a transactional partner, then you should expect transactional results, right? Man. No different than our that, no different than our personal lives, right? If if Man. you're dating, if you're dating, <laughs> if you're dating, and you are very comfortable, like and hey, uh, you know, I won't, I won't. Bill, all of my personal stuff, but if you're dating a, la, a younger version of me, right, you're not seriously committed. You're dating multiple people. You're really not giving much to anybody. You really shouldn't expect much back, right? And so mm -hmm. I think the two-way street of that with, 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 with carriers is what are the relationships you're building with your broker? What commitments maybe have you made to that broker? Um, how have you and that broker treated one another? But if you just want to pick up a load from a broker and think they're going to treat you like like that committed partner you want to be, that's unfair. Because if you actually look in the mirror, you probably realize that you haven't done the same for them. And so, wow, <laughs> yeah, that that is true. That is true. Because and, and it goes the other way for the broker, right? You just ask the question in the light of the carrier. But I would flip it and say, hey, same thing for the broker, like. Hey, do you know who your partners are? Do you know what people have committed to you? Do you have strong relationships with your carriers? And if not, don't expect to get great results when you want someone to do something that, quite honestly, the market may not bear. So it goes both ways. You know, I agree. I do have my brokers that, uh, man, they will 
they will go to the moon and back for what I, I bring to the table. And I am so grateful for them. But you're right that they're, they're not folks that, you know, I'm just treating transactionally. I, you know, those are the type of folks that I do things at times that I don't even think I'm going to get paid for. You know what I mean? It's just mm-hmm. like uh, just adding what what type of value adds can I bring to the table? And uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, man. It is about it is about uh, seeing it in the, the bigger the longer the big picture the long run versus you know that transactional situation okay this this business can be so transactional right and that's one of the things i think is sad about you know people talk about the human element i mean i think all business is really the human element now the tooling is tech the, the technology is great um we get a lot of communication from 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 our carriers that hey we really like the fact that you pick up the phone yeah, we like the load boards. Yeah, the stuff. Yeah, the automation. You can have all that stuff too. But like the folks that spend their time on the road that are committing hundreds of hours driving across country doing a job that is really arduous and challenging, like at the end of the day, you know what, too? They, they kind of want to know that they've got that level of respect and they've got a person on the other line that respects what they do, someone they can work through problems with. So that's where I think the whole idea of just this fully digital automated Thing. I think that really is a pitch more to um, a lot of the shippers out there, right, from efficiency and timing. But a lot of the small carriers, man, they, they still want to have those relationships. They still want to have that level of respect. I come back to that word because that's that's really what we try to deliver. Um, but, but but you can't void yourself of those interpersonal relationships. Otherwise, it's, it's really hard to get that just through a, an app on a phone. Yes, sir. I agree. I agree 100 percent. And uh, OK, cool. So what's let's pivot just a, a, a bit just because you know i did want to talk about your organization um ten, 10 months in the game but man the splash that you guys are making is turning to a tidal wave you know i'm seeing you <laughs> at i'm seeing you at all these conferences you know and i mean you're there very present how does it feel to you know go to these uh different industry events and represent freight Bana? It's it's so I'm I love you asked that I was just in in an event industry event last week in San Diego and I was riding with my my two key guys Josh that does our social media Don my CTO and as we're driving up I literally had this that that kind of one of those moments I've had it multiple times in this 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 journey Joey but I had this moment where you know we're riding to this meeting we're riding to the conference we're sitting in the car we're wearing our freight Vana swag, right? We got our, mm-hmm. we're doing our thing. We're on our way. And I'm just sitting there thinking, this is so crazy. Like this is happening. Right. And that's the coolest part about this journey is that, you know, you think about a journey, you wonder what a journey would be like uh, for anybody listening. Like, you know, you kind of got to take the leap if you want the rewards, you know? So I could have thought about that journey, could have kept my corporate job, could have done all that, could have wondered what if, could have asked all the those questions that many of us have, but we took the journey. So I was just, it's, it's a, it's this wild, um, prideful, um, very humbling opportunity to be showing up at a conference, representing a brand that you've started built from scratch, have all these ambitions around. And then the cool part for me is I've got so many cool relationships Mm -hmm. um, that I've, that I've formed in the industry, um, partnerships, people I've learned from people I reached out to, right. Cause you got to realize when I grew up within the night swift, kind of enterprise and walls let's be honest like non-asset logistics is not the core competency of those legacy organizations right and so kind of was task charged part of the job was to 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 up that game to improve those systems and in order to do that i share that to tell you that those conferences those peers those quote-unquote competitors were the people that I really learned from, right? Those are the people that I call if I had to ask a question. Um, and so for anybody that's trying to build um, a, an organization, a brokerage organization, a dispatch organization, like I'd, I'd ask like, who's your peer set? Who do you reach out to? Who's your phone a friend? Like who's similarly situated to you that you can call and get some advice from? Most people are like, oh, I don't share anything because I have this magic sauce. And it's like, <laughs> it, it, it's a big ocean. And I'm sure your sauce isn't that magical, right? Like, 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 let's just be honest. Like, let's be a little humble. And hey, if you have these friendships, and then I can't tell you how many times I get a call or I'll make a call. It's just literally on one this morning with a CEO that, that works for a large consulting firm. And right, like five conversations later, he's got me teed up with this guy that's just amazing. 
right? For my needs, my, my, you know, this thing that I'm doing. And so like, and I would have never had that had I not been to these conferences and met, met this individual and we're having a conversation in San Diego. And next thing you know, this, t- you know, I'm on a call solving a huge business problem with the perfect guy, but only because I could tap into that network. Um, whereas if I would have kept everything close to the vest and not shared and not been personable and not asked questions and not formal relationships, like I'm just floating around wondering what's possible. And so you ask like how you grow, like you have to have a, a, a professional network that you can utilize to answer questions and help you expand. Otherwise doing it all on your own and figuring it all out on your own is really, really tough. Yes, sir. You know, um, I've mentioned this in the past um, because I I heard it. I saw it as a a quote written on uh, social media somewhere, but it was saying that having access to people who are smarter than you shouldn't be a threat. It should be, you know, you should be appreciative of that, you know, being able to reach out to folks who uh, have already been through what you're currently going through and, you know, having the foresight to (laughs) build the relationship so they'd be even willing to talk to you, talk to uh, talk you through whatever you're going through. And, uh, you know, that is that's a, that's a huge thing. I, I used to feel as though I had to keep things a little bit closer. But once I tra- I said I was going to be transitioning out of corporate America and, you know, going to be an entrepreneur uh, that that can, that went completely out the window. <laughs> <laughs> it has to, man. Like I, people ask me all the time, like, hey, give me the give me the recipes. Give me this. It's like do do things the right way even i mean this is just like cookie cutter right hallmark card stuff but like the reason why this team's here with me jory is because they saw how i treated them how i interact with them my passion my ambition for almost a decade right and so then when you go do your own thing you're like here's what i'm gonna do they believe in you right now you know what i mean like because the way i acted for eight years the reason why i can call and get assistance and help is because I've been able to assist and help others and be willing to do that. And so it's a give and take, just like we talked about uh, on the other relationships. So having those things and making sure you invest in giving. Like that's the one thing I think to your point, Joe, you highlight for me is, is early on in the, in, in the uh, you know, John and I quit our jobs. We're not on salaries. We have no business, no team, no revenue, no capital, no nothing. You want to talk about like a humbling really beautiful experience and then you really find out who your friends are you really find out who you treated well you really find out what you know like it's this crazy litmus test and you also figure out who believes in you and that is a special experience that quite honestly when you're just going through corporate america you don't really get to fully test and so i love that experience and test personally professionally as we started this this business you know a year ago nice 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 so taking it back to the um, you know, just the conferences, um, you know, like I said, I've seen you guys at a, a few and I was just recently at one here in the Atlanta area and I was speaking to one of these unicorn, unicorn freight brokerages, one of their mm-hmm. senior folks. And he, he says something and it just it made me die laughing. And I was just like, uh, I was like, are you enjoying yourself at this conference? He was like, yeah, I am. You know, this right here is a, a back solicitor's paradise. You know what I mean? <laughs> because you're, you're, you're able to speak to all these customers that you shouldn't have no business speaking to. So, um, you know, I just thought that was really funny, um, you know, at the at the Modex conference here in the Atlanta area. Um, and I, I hope that I can get up to the what, what what's that called up in in Chicago? It's like. Promat, yeah, I think it's Promat, Promat for 2023. I think I'm gonna try to uh, get up to Chicago for that one. That's cool, um, man. I'm not familiar with that conference, but the the conference that changed my life was in Chicago, and uh, it was a freight waves conference in 2019. Um, and that was kind of where I had my aha moment on, hold on, like this stuff, like what does it take to show up differently? I think I wrote at the top of my paper right uh, on mm-hmm. that day and that kind of that that was the thing that was like the harbinger from change that i could never shake that was like wait show up differently how would you do that what would you build how would you you know what i mean and that that thought just continued to grow in me but that event in chicago like changed my life nice nice you know freight waves does it at a level that you know most can only dream of um and I think they have what the future of freight coming up in Arkansas pretty soon. Uh, you want to be there? I am not attending that one particularly. I have got some other uh, commitments on the uh, 
carry and shipper side that we have to take on. But uh, those events are great. And hey, you do, they do it at another level. But go back and look at the story. Like Craig hasn't been doing it for 20 years. He doesn't come right. from a family that's done it. Like Craig had a vision and a dream and he's playing that out, which a lot of kudos and credit to him and what he's built. It's, it's a really yeah. special, special thing he's built. But but also doesn't have, you know, a decade's worth of tenure. It's it's just a dream and, and, and his horsepower and his vision and his investment and his risk. And he's brought it all together, which is awesome. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I um, agree. So uh, for the for the folks listening, chase those dreams. OK, it's all possible. Just do the work. Um, but, yeah, even when it comes down to it, uh, like I know that you were talking about your organization and how you know, people were able to see you for eight to 10 years. And that was one of the reasons why they were very comfortable supporting you now, whether they wanted to work with you or just help or any of those type of good things. Oh, uh, now you have your own organization and it's, it's, it's very new. Like how, how important is leading by example um, at this stage in your, your, your company, um, you know, tenure? The most important, right? I mean, you can just scrap. I'll give you a great example. So Johnny and I, we went to to kind of raise some capital to start the business. Um, We had the name, wanted to develop a logo, had someone very cheaply develop our first logo, right? That's the one we used for the first six months, right? Let's call it the first half of last year before we even hired a teammate, anything like that, right? We used this logo to do all that stuff. You're talking about leading by example. So we show up here, uh, Jory, week one, and the team looks at the logo. My head of VP of pricing and networks, as well as a couple other people are like, that logo is trash. You're like, oh, <laughs> right now, now, you know, talk about leading by example, but let's talk about like how you set up the organization. So this is day one or two of our company, right? Like, hey, that logo that we keep using, like that's trash. And I'm like, oh, okay. Now, what I appreciate, and this is where you start to see kind of maybe the special nature of our team in general. So number one, they feel like they can come to me day one and tell me that the logo that we just hung up is trash. So that's cool that they feel empowered to do that. Uh, The second thing that's really cool is we've got, so not only is it trash, but my VP of network and pricing, um, Jeff Newsom, about a 20 year industry vet, loves the creative side of imagery and photography and logos. So he spends, I'd have to ask him, but based on the work I saw, at least 10 full hours putting together examples of logos that we could have, um, presents them all to the team, gives me his best three options. Next thing you know, a few days later, we're doing, we're having a conversation. The logo that you see for Freight Bonnet today, which I love, I think it's, it's obviously awesome, but I love the story behind it. That logo was created by him, not a professional company, the first week we're in, he took he kind of tipped the pen and said, hey, let me create something special. The team voted on it. And by four, the first week was over. You know what was cool? We had a brand new logo. The team was bought in on it. Um, and people knew right away, like, hey, you can you can absolutely challenge John and Shannon. But, hey, are you willing to be creative? Are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to go through the thought? And, hey, those, that level of effort or passion will be met with with uh an ear and an openness that that john and i promote and so i think when you talk about leading by example those are those moments where as a leader for for anybody listening you have to be aware you have to have self-awareness and too many times in my career Jerry, i see people that are leading and their awareness level like if we're looking like in a madden score right you like your madden jory uh you know i used to i used to tear them up in afghanistan okay right so so like hey uh compensation 99 (laughs) <laughs> um, experience 95, uh, awareness score 62. You're like, Oh wait, what happened to that guy? Right? Like, so if you're going through a Madden score, like I've worked with too many professionals that don't have that awareness. And the problem is it takes away from all the other great attributes that they have. Right, right, right. Agreed. 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 And how, how important do you, how important is like doing everything by the book for you right now? You know, so that those those habits that would have to get extracted don't get started in the first place. Yeah, I think you set like kind of the bumpers, so to speak. But as far as a book in startup mode, and you can appreciate this, we don't really have a book, right? We have a lot of experienced <laughs> veterans. Uh, we're in meetings every day, figuring out our path, um, questioning some of the paths that we're on. 
um, challenging one another. So there really is no book for what we're doing. Um, you see with some of our solutions that we're offering, how we built this business, the trailer pools were deli- like, there's just a unique component of our business that we don't know the answers to. Right. And, and we're aware of that. And we're working through it every day to figure it out. We're, we're, we're writing the book as we go. So I think having the bumpers on like, Hey, here's the do's and don'ts. And everybody's kind of aware of that the mutual respect, super important. But as far as like having a playbook um, or a, you know, 90 page employee handbook, like all oh, that's for the birds. I think if people love and respect one another, then you're going to get the better results. Go back to pick up basketball, right? You can have all the rules, all the stuff, all the titles. At the end of the day, if you're willing to play for someone else more than you're willing to play for yourself and you get a whole group of those people, you can do some special things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And look, you mentioned something. I didn't. Uh, what do you mean by the trailer pool? What do you guys have going on? Let's talk oh, so, about so you haven't even you haven't <laughs> even paid attention, Jory. What? You're missing. So, I'm just kidding. Uh, so we we have uh, announced nationally. This is a couple of weeks ago, but we announced uh, a nationwide trailer pool. Um, where our pool is called our pooling solution. Our great pool solution is called Freightvana X, um, and it's a nationwide deployment. By the end of 22, we'll have approximately a thousand trailers deployed across the country. Um, and the cool part about that is we've got shippers that are signing up because it solves a lot of problems. We've got a lot of small and medium sized owner operators and carriers that are excited because now they get access to freight that they typically haven't had access to. Um, we're planning on growing the operation um, uh, at, at a large level uh, in the months and, and quarters and years to come. And so it's just a really cool thing that we're doing. Um, that's differentiated. We've got a lot of skin in the game. We've got a lot of smart people building it. And we've got a lot of shippers and carriers, like I said, that are really interested. So uh, for us, it's a huge, it's a huge bet. It's a huge capital investment. Um, but we, 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 we know the business well. Coming from Night Swift, we're very comfortable with with assets um, and power only solutions. And so we feel like we're primed and ready to to deliver the country something unique and differentiated. Um, and we're excited about it. Nice, man. That's awesome. And yeah, I can I can imagine power only small, you know, small mom and pop shops that have, uh, you know, five to 10. You know, I don't know how many uh, carriers you guys are wanting to get, on, get, excuse me, get in on this. But yeah, that's very exciting. Um, is, you know, is it the ideal situation to do uh, not not necessarily drop in hooks, but, you know, round trip situations? Both, both. We, we are building networks, right, um, with our partners. We're doing some short haul regional work, right? So people that, that they're interested in kind of quasi dedicated, dedicated that want to sleep in their beds every night that they can do there. Um, and we're also doing some, some, some power lanes one way as we build out our network and we're giving the carriers a few days, you know, depending on transit time to, to utilize the trailer uh, on, on, on the backhaul uh, to bring our trailer back to us. So we got a variety of solutions, but short haul regional power only but but not everything is round trip and, and, and we uh trust and empower our carriers to, to use our expensive equipment and bring it back to us <laughs> uh, in the in the condition we gave it to them and a lot of people respect that because like i said they get access to to networks and lanes that typically um only the larger mega carriers with the trailer pools get access to them so we're opening up a a really cool channel uh that we're excited about okay cool 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 yeah that's awesome man and uh I'm, I'm probably going to have to follow up with you or someone in sales later uh, to to learn more about how to get my co- my carriers, you know, integrated um, as you guys, you know, roll that bad boy out. Um, Definitely. Really good. Sounds really good. OK. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I wanted to make sure that we covered everything that you might have wanted to speak about uh, here on this platform about Freightvana. Was there anything that you wanted to say that we did not discuss so far? No, I'm just really passionate about the industry. Um, hopefully anybody, you know, like you mentioned yourself, when you reach out to us, humble, hungry, um, you know, we're passionate to, to change uh, the logistics industry. And I know everybody says that, right? But, but, but think about some of the tooling that I mentioned. Uh, think about our unique experiences. We've got proprietary systems that we're, we're deploying that, that help us deliver on that differentiation. The last one I think I'd really highlight, uh, Jory, is, is, is in sustainability, right? So we partnered with One Tree Planted uh, early, I call it four or five months ago. And so we've made a commitment to tangible sustainability efforts. And we're literally planting a tree 
with our partnership with One Tree Planted for every single load we do every day, every week. And so that is a special partnership for anybody that doesn't know about One Tree Planted. What a great organization. I suggest they follow on social. Look at all they're doing. One Tree Planted, just so you know, is an organization that worldwide this year alone, Jory, will plant somewhere between 30 and 35 million trees. Mm, man, you know, now, I was waiting to re- I was waiting to react after you were finished because, uh, you know, my mouth was just over here like, oh, man, OK, OK. You know, I love that's that's my language. I love that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, that's awesome, brother. That's so awesome. How do so, you? I, How'd you get linked up with them? So, so we, you know, so once again, we, we really showed up here. We wanted to be different when navigating the space, navigating comp- competitors, people in the industry, right? I think there's this overwhelming kind of odd, oddly positioned kind of mindset of like all these intermediaries that are, you know, committed to sustainability. And I kind of looked at it and, you know, and whether that's, you know, creative math, uh, certain Excel sheets that they justify certain things that they're doing. I think it's all a little too ambiguous. So what we really have this passion on is like, what can we do that's tangible, that we believe in, that our team can rally around? And so my head of sales, um, Lars Wars, he actually stumbled across, found uh, One Tree Planted. We reached out to their leadership. We wanted to learn more about them. Um, They didn't really have a presence in the us for like third party intermediaries right like no one had really joined that effort and we thought what a cool opportunity for us to champion change right and actually one of the shippers that have a great relationship kind of challenged me in that way is like hey that's cool that you do it like shannon you've got to be a leader like you you've got to make it bigger than you and it'll be even more special and so i kind of carried that kind of sword if you will on like okay like we're going to go out and we're going to lead we're going to do this thing we're going to lead by example But the other thing that's really cool right now, Jory, is I've got multiple CEOs and organizations that are in conversations with One Tree Planted. They're figuring out how to make it their own. We're all going to collaborate. We're all going to move the industry forward. We're all going to be supporting this tangible change effort um, of sustainability and supporting a great organization like a One Tree Planted. And so, like, you talk about pride and you talk about purpose. And you talk about fulfillment, like think about what that looks like five, six, seven, ten years from now. Like that has nothing to do with loads moved or employees or revenue or profitability. Like that is just looking back and being like, damn, like I helped make a difference. I'm proud of that. And that is the really cool thing that, you know, to answer your question of anything to share, like I'd want to share that. Like that's important. Man, I want to be a part of that. That then is, do it, brother. Hey, I'll yeah. say, let, hey, let's get Atlanta Dispatch on there, right? And hey, the cool part about One Tree Planet, there's no minimum. Like, Joe, you could log in tomorrow, and for Atlanta Dispatch, you could put 50 bucks on and plant 50 trees. And you could let's tell them where you it. want them planted. You know what I'm saying? And like, let's you could make something bigger for your team or whatnot. But like, I'd love to have you, your passion for the industry, your growing team, like, Hey, we're gonna we're gonna put something out that's gonna be like, hey, here's all the partners that have made a one tree planted commitment, and I'd love to have your logo next to ours. It'd, it'd be an cool. honor. I'm 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 in, brother. I'm in. <laughs> you, you had me when you first started talking about it. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> like one tree per load. How can I do that? And now I know it's possible. <laughs> hey, and you got to make a commitment, right? And and this is just like a startup, right? You got to start. Like a lot of people, oh, I want to do something. I want to give back. I want to do something cool. It's like. We just put our we just put our foot in the ground and this is what we're doing. And hey, there's other great causes. Right. So not to to normalize or uh, devalue anybody other efforts. But for us, this is tangible. It's meaningful. We know the impact and we're going to grow the heck out of it with partners like you and the other ones that are signing up. So when I look back, that's going to be a huge, huge piece of the Freight Fauna story that we're all going to be proud of. Yes, sir. Man, yeah, that that's definitely going to be a nice thing to look back at, um, you know, 10 years from now. So uh, I appreciate you even, you know, bringing that one to the to the stage because I wasn't expecting it, didn't know <laughs> anything about it. But, uh, you know, that that's definitely me, brother. Thank you so much. I'm here for the surprises. And hey, OneTreePlanted.org, the easiest find there is for anybody listening. And hey, you, you can 
you can decide at what level it, you know you want to support it. And yeah, you and I can talk offline and figure out what that means for some future stuff. But I, I'd love it if you would join us. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. I'm there. Um, and look, I know that I know that the room's a little light right now. <laughs> um, were there any questions from the audience? Like, did anybody have any questions? Because if so, uh, definitely now is the time. Um, but at the end of the day, Shannon. I want to say thank you, brother, because I know you have so much going on, you know, starting a, a new organization that is clicking at the rate that you guys are clicking. You know, I know you're being pulled in so many different directions. So to uh, make time to discuss your organization on the transportation and logistics clubhouse, uh, I am very, very appreciative. And, you know, if there's anything I can do to help, uh, whether it be to, you know, promote you guys or, um, you know, One Tree Planet, I'm there too. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much, brother. Hey, always, man. Thanks for reaching out. I love people that have passion for the industry. I love people that are trying to build something like you're doing. Um, Clubhouse is a really cool platform, to be honest. I don't have a ton of experience on. So when I got the invite from you specifically, as well as the Clubhouse thing, I'm like, hey, this is cool. Let's do something different, right? And so that's why I'm here today, man. And uh, Hopefully there's some value. Hopefully there's some nuggets that people that are listening have. And hey, undoubtedly, like uh, what's cool about uh, media is it, it it lasts beyond even the live feed, right? And so I'm sure there's going to be some some opportunities for other people to have some nuggets, take some pieces away from what you and I have shared today. And, and that means a lot. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, well, look, um, we are going to go ahead and bring tonight's room to a close. Um and if you guys need anything from me, you know where to find me. You can reach me, um, you know, my, my contact information is in my profile, or you can just go straight to my Instagram. Um, you will be able to uh, be here again on Monday. You know, on Mondays, we partner with Freight Waves. Uh, they're Sonar team to tell the folks where to send your trucks and the places to avoid. So uh, come in Monday, 730 in the morning uh, to hear that discussion. Uh, but again, Shannon, have a blessed evening, sir. And thank you again. Hey, appreciate you, Jordan, man. Thank you. All right now. Peace. See ya. Peace.